Welcome everybody and this is the webinar where we talk about our insights for 2022. I have at my table to my left Dipo Denloy. Welcome Dipo. He's a solution architect for Orange Cyber Defense. We have Rob Peters also joining to my left. He is our lead solution architect. Uh, to my right at the, at the end of the table Dennis Switzer who is our MTD solution architect. And finally, to my right, Jort Collery, our uh, Head of Ethical Hacking and Security Consult Consultancy. Welcome everybody. Um, today, we're, as I uh, said in the introduction, we're going to talk about what will be happening to our, in our mind in the 22 uh, threat landscape. And I, I think um, I speak for everybody uh, around the globe that ransomware we've seen in the last year is an issue. But how do we expect uh, it will develop in the 2022? Jort. Uh, it will be bigger. It will evolve in, in, in a more dramatic uh, situation around the globe. That's for sure, because we have seen in the last year that uh, ransomware is impacting many organizations in every segment and branch. Uh, so ransomware will be there. It will not be gone yet, unfortunately. And this is um, even considering that we are putting major amounts of money and people and resources uh, into the cybersecurity uh, threat landscape to avoid these uh, uh, ransomware attacks. And still you're saying um, it will continue. But why? Well, uh, we live in an interconnected world. And uh, so every organization is connected to the Internet because of the digital transformation, uh, the demands of the clients, suppliers and partners in the field of organizations are working all digital. Uh, so information is shared digitally. Uh, so it will be uh, uh, impacting organizations in, of any size. But also what we see uh, is the IT and OT uh, convergence. Uh, so o uh, OT is more being um, um, transferred. Okay, sorry, what is OT? It's operational technology. So factories, basically. Yeah, mainly uh, uh, used in factories, manufacturing plants. Uh, and it's, it's traditional technology that uh, lasts for many years, like 20, 30 years. Uh, and it hasn't been developed uh, in, in, in the past. But now the time is, is it's changing. So uh, it's more IP-based rather than bus technology. So, uh, yeah, and the convergence uh, will increase the uh, connectivity around the globe and also uh, increases the uh, attack surface of uh, many organizations. Okay. Um, and that means that we need a, a different approach, basically uh, getting more sensors everywhere, uh, getting uh, yeah, basically more protection at every layer. Um, Dennis, how do you see that uh, in the... Yeah, XDR landscape, for instance. Yeah, <clears throat> a nice question. I think with regards to what, what uh, Jort already mentioned, I think the, the endpoint, and, and the endpoint can be a, a workstation, a laptop, but could also be a, a server for, for that kind. Um, I think the, the importance of the endpoint is, is growing with regards to detection and response. Um, where, where we first saw a, a trend that we wanted to get all logs on a central location to, to do correlation and analysis. Uh, we're now dealing with a, let's say, a scattered landscape um, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to, uh, to our, uh, our, our own environment. And we need to have that detection, that prevention, but also that response um, on, on that endpoint layer as well. So basically what you're saying, it's not just the IT, OT convergence, it's also <laughs> that our data is following the business even into the cloud. Yeah. And that the emphasis on getting the, the right data, regardless uh, where uh, the, the endpoint is or the data is, we should protect it? Yeah, I think so. Because the, with, with the uh, transition to the cloud, ongoing transition to the cloud, the ITOT convergence, the, the endpoint is becoming a, a crucial stepping stone for attackers. So. Um, on top of what we're doing to protect the network, to look into network traffic, we need to be able to, to let's say, 
almost containerize that, that, that endpoint if necessary. And we need to know what's happening on that endpoint to see if there's any, yeah, let's phrase it like that stepping stone activity to more move towards or our cloud environment data which is there, or for example, to, to the OT environment. So it requires a different approach, basically. So what tells that about how the, uh, the organizations are organized now? Now, from that perspective, and then from my perspective, and, 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 and managed detection and response perspective, we, we see a shift, and, and the shift is that we're um, we're moving away to single single-handedly focusing on detection, but we're moving to a towards a uh, yeah approach where we focus on prevention, detection, and response in, in one, and, and that's where the, uh, uh, the, the the upcoming XDR uh, 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 trend comes from that instead of focusing on a, a sim solution which we have to build ourselves we have to uh, configure ourselves we see um, we, we move away from to let's say that endpoint focus where we combine endpoint data and we combine it with traffic network traffic and we combine it with user activity um, in, in a central detection and correlation engine where we yeah we, we call it XDR but where we shift from that central point in our organization to prevention detection and response on an endpoint level. And is that just solely because of the pandemic that we see that change or are there? No, I think it, it, it uh, heavily contributed to it because everyone was working from home. But mm -hmm. I think it's a trend we, we've been seeing also starting before the pandemic where we uh, we wanted to get more focus and more control over our endpoints. I think hence the, the, the growing market for, for endpoint detection and response. But since we now know it's not just endpoints, endpoints are crucial, but it's also network and it's also other log sources. Uh, we see that trend growing towards XDR, and I think the pandemic and working from home uh, heavily contributed to that, yes. Yeah, so uh, looking to the rest, so do we see other things we can clearly contribute, basically, to the, the new reality, the, the working from home? Do we, can we detect other shifts uh, as a result of that, basically? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the work from home shift has, 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 has changed a lot. Um, before I go into there, perhaps let me reframe the conversation a little bit, taking us a step back. Um, we all know that uh, enterprises are moving towards um, a, a cloud strategy, and this is to drive their digital transformation. So if you know the 80-20 principle rule that applied to cloud migration, initially we had around 80% of the workload on-prem, and now that 80 is moving towards the cloud. What the pandemic has now done is apply that same shift towards the workforce because we had 80% of the workforce in the office and now, because of the pandemic, now working from home. The way that we've traditionally built our security architecture has been a cloud, has been a castle and moat architecture. And that architecture is one that draws the perimeter of defense around the LAN around the data centers. But now we have a problem because the data, the workloads are moving to the cloud. They've left the premises. The users have also left the premises. So what are we defending in the castle? So we need a shift in our thinking around this castle and mode architecture. And therefore we need a new strategy. And that's why Gartner came up with this term called cybersecurity mesh. It basically draws the new line of defense around the users and around the data. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the cloud, whether you're on-prem, whether you're in the data center, you're able to have security wherever you are. So the cybersecurity mesh is based upon three foundational tenants. Number one is a distributed identity fabric. We know that the, in the identity uh, market today, there's uh, so many tools available I mean, you have privilege access management, identity governance and administration, so many different tools. Mm. This needs to be consolidated and it needs to be unified. So there's two ways that we can do that. You can either ensure integration amongst all these different tools. Also, we see, what we also see in the market is the market is moving towards consolidation. So for example, the leaders in privilege access management, they're acquiring companies that are doing identity. And the identity governance vendors are also acquiring capabilities to do, to do privilege access management. So there's a consolidation happening in the market. And sooner, well, there's certain companies that are claiming that they can do it now and have that unified identity uh, fabric already. 
but surely this is the way that the market is going. The second tenant that we see is the ability to have um, security analytics, intelligence, and automation. So as Dennis was talking about with XDR and also to detection and response uh, technologies, these leverage AI and, and AI artificial intelligence and machine learning, and they're great, but what we have to see and what we have to do is move away from the silos of the past and basically make sure all our security tools are integrated and they're interoperable. I can give an example of a specific customer that we're actually starting, with, <coughs> starting implementing the cybersecurity mesh with. And uh, we came into the environment and we analyzed the environment. And we didn't say, we want to create the cybersecurity mesh, so we have to throw everything out. No. We had a look at the environment and said, what can we integrate with, with your existing, existing tools that they have in place? So we decided to put a network detection and response tool that integrated with the existing endpoint detection and response tool. And what you get is a sharing of data between these two tools, giving you more powerful detections because you have data coming from the endpoints and the network is correlating that with what it's seen, being able to give you more high fidelity alerts. So the take home is mm -hmm. that when you're, don't, don't, don't throw everything that you have away, integrate as much as possible. If you're yeah, and sorry. It's, uh, sorry, but that is exactly what you're saying as well, right? With yeah. The whole XDR movement. So yeah, <clears throat> I think that that's what we're trying to be to to achieve through a, a let's say a, a sim solution, but that that's just a product approach. Um, but I think underlying, I, I totally agree with what you say. We need to move towards an, an integrated approach where we where we're working with uh, solutions who are able to communicate with each other, and we're 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 able to take informed decisions based on a, a correlated view we have on, uh, on the entire cybersecurity spectrum within our organization. Yes, absolutely. So the third tenant of the cybersecurity mesh is the ability to have a centralized policy orchestration as well as a distributed policy enforcement. So your centralized policy orchestration can be in the form of uh, some kind of controller, but it needs to be cloud-based. All the cyber mesh tools need to be cloud-based because in the cloud is where you have the scalability and flexibility to be able to protect the users regardless of their location. When it comes to the distributed enforcement, this can be in the shape of agents on an endpoint or it can be in the form of cloud proxies or CASB uh, uh, solutions. The most important thing is that we're able to secure the users wherever they are, whether on-prem, in the data center or in the cloud, security should be able to follow the users. And this is also, um, we were able to achieve this by decoupling the controller aspect from the enforcement aspect. Yeah. And I think this links in very much from uh, a trend that we see in the infrastructure perspective as well. So if I look at the LAN1 environment, we've already seen a lot of changes around uh, traditional uh, LAN environments moving to an, uh, an SD LAN environment where same as Deepu says, the intelligence being centralized, being uh, cl cloud-based, and, and then the, the actual enforcement is happening on, on a local level. We see more convergence in, in that happening as well, where security becomes not an on-top-of thing that we add to it in the Kessel and Moat approach, but more integrated. We've seen vendors teaming up with security uh, partners, security companies to, to integrate that, to make it part of the solution. And we, we talked about data centers, but... I believe we have a shift from uh, data going from data centers to centers of data. Hmm. So places where on the edge where where more of the the information is being is is distributed and, and the di sorry I need to rephrase that the data is distributed the information is being centralized again. But we want to protect the data as well. So the idea around some new architectures that are starting to develop with some of the vendors we're working with is is that there's a possibility to make, for example, your switches, your, your infrastructure, your local, uh, more capable in a security perspective. So add the security on top of the infrastructure directly to, to be able to better prevent, uh, yeah, to, to shield the service for, for, for attacks uh, and threats that might happen from that point of view as well. So that is something we, that whole convergence, I think we're all, all agreeing on that, that that is happening at this moment in time and will continue to do so in 2022. So, so what you're saying that in the, um, let's say in the next year or probably somewhere in the next year, uh, even where 
uh, we approach the network as it needs to be there. It's just like electricity coming from the sockets. Yeah. Need to uh, worry free that we're now seeing uh, due to this whole integration of security functions as well that we uh, are now adding the network as a, another sensor to the to the whole intelligence framework, so to say. Correct. And that we apply, uh, we are able to apply security as close to the endpoint as possible. Yeah, that, that's exactly where, where we believe that this is going to, towards to. And I, I feel that there's, there's quite a few vendors that go into that direction as well. And it opens up uh, potential different avenues. We have very traditional architectures with, with the Castle and Moat approach once again. Um, but but now we once we go from a distributed point of view, uh, you need to change in that regard as well. So I, I think you'll see different companies taking different strategies, and you'll see that there's going to be more uh, more complexity in a certain way for 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 companies to choose a, a specific approach. And it really depends on what vertical you are, what type of company you are, and what type of threat level you have against you, basically, to see how you protect and how you need to protect against it. And that comes back in, uh, to a discussion Jort and I had earlier. Uh, so we need to start thinking like the attacker and see what the price is. And maybe you can, after hearing all this convergence, uh, how would you say the proper approach on that, uh, on that level is? Um, well, organizations should be looking at uh, what are, they, are we doing, what are my crown jewels in order to protect them. Uh, and you have to identify risk as well. What's my risk and what is my risk appetite in the ever-evolving threat landscape? If you have identified, you are able to, uh, yeah, to go with harmonized solutions uh, to protect your castle. Uh, and, and you can't protect everything. Uh, it's finding the right balance in, in protection, detect, and response. Uh, you can't do only one of them. No. Mm. Not only no. two. You need to do more than two in order to protect your castle. So what you're, if I interpret loosely, it, it will, as always, be a balance between driving your business at one end and making sure the business is protected sufficiently. And what's the gap in between is basically your risk appetite. Right. But how do we need to change if we know the risk appetite? So um, all the companies nowadays are focusing on the latest and greatest, the best in breed, and it's primarily uh, technology driven. So how do we extrapolate that and focus on the more converged approach? Do we really care who has the... Uh, yeah, let's say the the greatest uh, uh, single functionality, the the point solution, or is uh, abstracting that to a higher level uh, nowadays the name of the game. So if I can answer uh, that one, um, I feel that uh, traditionally we had a lot of let's say technical requests coming from the market. They wanted to ask a lot about, hey, what are the bits and bytes of this solution, and exactly like you said, point solutions maybe combine a couple of point solutions and then create a managed service around it. What I've seen uh, starting up more and more this year, and I believe this continues next year as well, is that we will see more functional type of requests. So customer has a certain business to do, they want IT to support that business, how do we achieve that? And dear integrator, we're gonna ask you for your, your approach. So we're not gonna, we're gonna hire expensive consultants anymore, to, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, set up all the bits and bytes for us and then push it out to the market. No, we want the, the real story from the integrators. And I think you'll see a different uh, approach there as well. And I think we need to look at how we could become, as integrators, but also as customers, a more service-focused uh, approach as well. So service-focused, and an example of that one is uh, we uh, use uh, service level agreements to mm -hmm. measure technically what our response capabilities are, uh, like availability and all these technical indicators to say, hey, our service is doing well or our service is not doing so well. And then we get penalized for the fact that we missed a couple of these indicators. But it's a very negative way of, of looking at it. And we see the market change towards a user experience type of approach where uh, it's very much more about how do we experience that service. So... These unwritten rules that are part of an SLA can now be put into something like, we call it an XLA, that's the, the, the improvement on, on an SLA, so the, the, the experience level agreement. And what we see there is that we can now start writing these unwritten rules and start to positively enforce them. So if, if the integrator does more to help 
their customers achieve their targets, they will be receiving a bonus rather than part of the money being uh, removed from a monthly subscription. That is n in no contrast to what a company would lose anyways if their IT doesn't fall apart anymore. Yeah, but that's easier said than done, I have to imagine, because yep. the SLAs are there for a reason. Because, um, like you said, they uh, are they're given clear indicators of what the service should look like and much less focus. So, um, and I'm looking to Jort again, um, that requires a certain level of maturity, understanding your business, how your business requires security at one end and tries to balance that out. So, yeah, on the maturity level, that also applies for cyber security. Yeah, exactly. Um, most clients don't have insight in their current security posture. Um, we often do security maturity assessments with clients and we always uh, ask them at upfront uh, what kind of level do you have on the capability maturity model index, the CMMI. And they often rank themselves higher uh, than they actually are. And, and why is that? Uh, because they think they do a good job, uh, but they have never uh, measured their, their own maturity uh, at all. So uh, they think they do a good job because they have uh, the top of the bill firewall, they have like the products, all the shiny technology that is available. But the problem uh, lacks in uh, harmonized solutions as Depot mentioned already. Uh, and security has changed over the co uh, last couple of years. Uh, organizations need to be adaptive, adaptive to the ever-evolving threat landscape. Um, but also, uh, we need to understand what we are protecting. Uh, I often ask clients, you know, what are you protecting? What are you doing? And they don't know. They don't know. They, they say, oh, after a while, yeah, uh, intellectual property, uh, yeah, privacy uh, information, uh, some other things. But what are you protecting actually? What is your biggest concern? What keeps you awake at night? And then they start thinking. And with a security maturity assessment, we uh, assess them on people, process, and technology uh, with many questions mm -hmm. from different uh, standards and frameworks uh, in the, in the cybersecurity industry. And uh, we assess them, and they are always ranking lower. But it's a good starting point, point to understand where you're at and where you can grow to. And next to that, because it's an interview-based assessment, mm -hmm. uh, we always uh, advise to do also like a technical assessment. Because what uh, maybe the people in the company say about their current security posture actually doesn't show up in the technical assessment. So the proof is in the pudding. True. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Hey, uh, we're almost out of time. I would like to uh, thank you very much. Um, I would. I'm going to end off with a single question. So if you were a CEO of a big company and you had to do a, a one investment on cybersecurity uh, services next year, and I'm going to ask this question to every one of you, what would it be? Deepo, you first. I would say invest in uh, uh, identity. Rob? Um, I'm going to... Uh I think identity is the biggest one for ne for next year. Absolutely. Yeah, I think maybe one or two years ago, my answer would have been uh, uh, EDR. But I think with the the involvement we currently see, I would definitely go for a that, that, that XDR approach. And you? Yeah, I always strongly advise to do a security maturity assessment and technical assessment. But I would go for identity too, because what we see with our assessments that users have uh, too many rights, and they should be focusing on least privilege. Micro credentials, basically. Yeah, absolutely. All right. all right. This was it. I would like to thank you all for this uh, enticing conversation and the insight for 2022. Uh, my name is Gilles van Heist, and I bid you farewell. Mm -hmm.